Las Vegas is known as many things. The entertainment capital of the world, the city of lights, Sin City, and America's playground. The state of Nevada legalized gambling in 1931, which opened a world of entertainment for the construction workers who were building the nearby Hoover Dam. In the 1960s, the term gambling turned into gaming and became a legitimate business model. The casinos and hotels in Las Vegas became bigger and flashier each year until it turned into the spectacle it's become today. Stephen Paddock was a man who didn't get along with many people. He spent most of his time doing his own thing, investing in property and gambling as a high roller. Then, he suddenly decided to kill as many people as he possibly could. This is Monsters. On the evening of October 1, 2017, a security alarm went off on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Casino and Hotel. This alarm had nothing to do with the man on that floor who was just minutes away from carrying out the deadliest mass shooting in United States history. No, this was a sensor on all of the room's doors that would alert the security office if a door had been left open for too long. Security officer Jesus Campos was sent to check on the alarm and he took the elevator to the 30th floor. Then he took the stairs to the 32nd floor. When he tried to go through the door from the stairwell into the hall, the door was jammed. He climbed the stairs to the 33rd floor and took the elevator back down to the 32nd floor. There he found a metal L bracket screwed into the stairwell door, keeping it closed. He called security dispatch and they connected him to the engineering department so he could get someone from maintenance to come and take a look at it. As he was waiting for them to arrive, he walked down the hall toward the room that had the alarm and he could hear a noise. He described it as sounding like a drill. As he got close to the end of the hall, Steven started shooting through the door and hit Jesus in the leg. Jesus was able to take cover in a doorway alcove and he radioed to dispatch that someone in Suite 32135 was shooting. Stephen Shuck was a maintenance worker at the hotel and he got off the elevator on the 32nd floor and began rolling his maintenance cart towards Suite 32135. Soon, Jesus was yelling to him that it was not safe. He yelled to Stephen to take cover and as the maintenance man tried to duck into another alcove, he was shot in the back. They both began radioing that there was an active shooter in Suite 32135 and the hotel security, who were headed out of the building to assist in locating the shooter they believed was outside, turned around and went up the elevator to handle the situation that was happening right there in their hotel. Stephen Paddock was born on April 9, 1953 in Clinton, Iowa. His parents were Benjamin Paddock and Dolores Hudson, who would end up having four sons together, with Stephen being the oldest. Sometime in the 1950s, the family moved to Arizona, and in 1960, Benjamin was arrested for a string of bank robberies in the Phoenix area. Coincidentally, Benjamin was arrested while in Las Vegas. From that point forward, the Paddock boys were without a father. Benjamin escaped from prison in 1968 and lived under the assumed identity Bruce Erickson in Oregon for almost 10 years before being captured. After Benjamin's arrest, Dolores moved the family to Southern California and tried to start fresh by pretending her husband was dead. She even told her sons that their father was dead. Stephen's younger brother, Eric, would say in a later interview that none of them had any influence from their father. Stephen attended John Francis Polytechnic High and other kids there said he was an average kid who was pleasant. People said that he was a brainy kid but defied the geek stereotype by dressing more like a hippie. After graduating high school in 1971, he enrolled in California State University Northridge and got a degree in business administration in 1977. As he came to the end of his college career, he took a job as a letter carrier for the United States Postal Service. Stephen also got married about the same time he graduated from college. His first wife was Sharon Brunholer, but the two divorced after a few years. By then, Stephen had begun working as an agent for the Internal Revenue Service and stayed there for about six years. 
Then he started working as an auditor for a defense contractor that would later become Lockheed Martin. Around this time, Stephen married again, this time to a woman named Peggy Akimoto, and they lasted five years before also getting divorced. Stephen's family said that he remained on good terms with both of his ex-wives, neither of which he ever had children with. Soon, Stephen was getting into the real estate game with his brother Eric. He started out by purchasing a modest house, and then two years later he bought a small apartment building in Los Angeles for $725,000. He would buy more small apartment buildings, and in the early 2000s, he sold at least four of them for a profit. He flipped some houses in there as well. He purchased a large apartment complex in Mesquite, Texas for $3.5 million and sold it eight years later for $4.6 million. He also owned another complex that brought him about $500,000 a year in income. He sold that property in 2015 for at least $5 million in profit. People that knew him said that, despite becoming a millionaire, he lived a fairly frugal life. Many times he would live in one of the apartment buildings he owned and he never drove a flashy car, preferring a standard, economical vehicle. As Stephen transitioned away from being an accountant to being a full-time real estate investor, he also took up gambling. It wasn't long before he transitioned away from being a real estate investor to being a full-time gambler. Stephen wasn't a flashy gambler, though. Like everything else in life, he liked to keep his gambling simple. His game of choice was video poker, and he would find a machine that was out of the way and sit and play for hours, usually betting at least $100 a hand. He was well known by the staff of the many casinos he frequented, but they didn't consider him a whale. Those were the people that would come in and spend the most, the highest of the high rollers. Playing video poker at $100 a hand was still noticed by the casino and he received many perks for his loyalty. He spent time playing at all of the casinos in Reno and Las Vegas. While gambling at the Atlantis Casino Resort and Spa in Reno, he met Mary Lou Danley who worked at the casino as a high-limit hostess. Mary Lou was married at the time but she eventually left her husband and began dating Stephen. They eventually moved in together, living in various places between Reno, Las Vegas, and Mesquite, Texas. Of course, the question of why Stephen did what he did would become the main focus of many people in October of 2017. This brought people to question his personality, his politics, his religion, and of course, his mental health. People that knew him said that he wasn't overly political. His girlfriend said that he didn't really like Obama and was happy when Trump got elected, but he never really talked a lot of politics with other people. The boyfriend of one of Mary Lou's sisters, an Australian man, said he had some robust conversations about gun laws with Stephen, who was well-versed in defending the Second Amendment. It wasn't until Stephen showed him his gun room in his mesquite home that he started feeling uncomfortable, but never to the point that he thought he would commit mass murder. Stephen was not religious and he had no criminal record. He got a traffic ticket once, which he paid, and that was it. Stephen also hadn't shown any signs of mental illness that doctors could find. He was quiet, private, sometimes not the friendliest person, but nobody would say he seemed mentally ill. He had some fears, according to his girlfriend. He was afraid of germs, which isn't entirely uncommon, and he was also afraid of taking medications, generally refusing them when they were needed. In the year prior to the attack, Stevens stepped up his purchase of firearms and ammunition, but it didn't set off any red flags at gun stores. Like I said, he had no criminal record. Despite never even hinting at a plan of a mass shooting, Stevens seemed to start preparing for it at least a year prior. And of course, he's not going to come out and say he's going to shoot up the Las Vegas Strip, but he didn't show a single sign that anything was wrong. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives reported that Stephen purchased more than 55 firearms between October of 2016 and September 25, 2017. Up until October of 2016, he had purchased 29 firearms, mostly handguns and shotguns. Then, in a single year, he bought 55 firearms, many of which were assault rifles, and nobody thought that was weird. Stephen had done research on festivals and events all over the place that would have large numbers of people outside. He picked the Route 91 Harvest Festival, which would be happening right next to the Mandalay Bay Casino, a place where Stephen gambled frequently. 
As a matter of fact, the weekend of the shooting, Stevens stayed in a suite at the hotel that was comped by the casino. In the month leading up to the shooting, Stephen and Mary Lou would stay at the casino hotel multiple times, and she would later say that he did seem to be interested in which rooms had a view of where the concert would take place. Stephen purchased a ticket for Mary Lou to visit her family in the Philippines, and once she was gone, he packed his bags. That included loading 23 rifles and a handgun into luggage and taking it to the Mandalay Bay Hotel. He checked in on September 25th, and a concierge took his initial load of luggage up to the 32nd floor where his comped suite was located, perfectly overlooking the venue where the Harvest Festival would happen. Over the next few days, Stephen can be seen on surveillance bringing more suitcases into the hotel. Nobody seems to notice because, well, it's a hotel. It wasn't unusual. Before the attack, Stephen wired $100,000 to Mary Lou with a note telling her to buy a house for herself and her family in the Philippines. She would tell police later that she thought he was breaking up with her. Wow, that's quite a breakup. At 10.05 p.m. on Sunday, October 1st, the last night of the festival, Stephen Paddock used a small sledgehammer to break two windows in his hotel suite and opened fire on the crowd of concertgoers. Stephen had 14 AR-15s with him and they all had bump stocks on them. A bump stock is an attachment for a semi-automatic rifle that allows you to fire it as if it's a fully automatic rifle. Pairing it with a high-capacity magazine, it can send a lot of bullets into a crowd very quickly. The one thing that it takes away is your ability to aim. The bump stock causes the body of the rifle to move back and forth quickly, making it impossible to use whatever type of sight might be on it. This might be why Stephen tried to purchase a large quantity of tracer rounds prior to the attack. A tracer round is a bullet that has a small incendiary charge at the base that makes it light up as it's moving through the air. A magazine is generally loaded with one tracer round for every four standard rounds to help see where you're shooting at night. An ammunition dealer said that Stephen wanted to purchase a large quantity of tracer rounds, but he couldn't accommodate the order, so Stephen never purchased any. If Stephen had used tracer rounds, he might have been more accurate, but he also would have given away his location and police might have gotten to him sooner. Without the tracer rounds, it was impossible to see where the bullets were coming from. Most people assumed he was on the ground. Due to the echo, people were reporting hearing gunshots at various casinos all over the Strip. This had police officers worry that there were multiple shooters in different hotels carrying out a coordinated attack. It was only a matter of minutes before Stephen had fired over 1,000 rounds into the festival crowd. First responders did everything they could to get people out of the area, but without knowing where the shooter was, it was hard to know which way to send them. It wasn't until Jesus radioed the security dispatch at the hotel that police were notified exactly where the shooter was. Stephen had taken precautions to give himself more time. He used an L bracket to lock the door to the stairs and he used a baby monitor camera to watch the hallway. In Stephen's mind, it would take time for people to figure out where he was. Then they would be slowed down by the secured door. What Stephen didn't plan for was a simple door alarm on one of the rooms. At the Mandalay Bay Hotel, if a door is left open too long, the security office will get an alert. Jesus arrived on the floor at 9.59 p.m. and was shot right when Stephen was starting his massacre. If that door alarm hadn't gone off, Stephen could have been up there shooting for much longer than he was. The first two police officers arrived on the 32nd floor of the hotel at 10.17. When more officers arrived a few minutes later, they began evacuating everybody from the floor. The officers saw wires going into Stephen's room, so they were afraid the door might be booby-trapped. They eventually used explosives to blow the door and gain entry to the suite. Inside, they found Stephen Paddock, dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Despite becoming the deadliest mass shooter in the United States, it seemed that Stephen's plan had actually failed. Stephen planned on ending far more lives that day. Inside his hotel room were calculations of target distance, his elevation, and the bullet trajectory. They detailed the drop of his bullet so he could figure out the best place to aim for maximum damage. 
They also found a makeshift gas mask made out of part of a snorkel and a blue tube that he ran into a different part of the suite. It's unclear what his plan for it was. The idea that he was attempting to kill far more people than he did was backed up by the sheer amount of firepower he brought with him. Authorities found 23 rifles and a handgun, 14 AR-15s, all with bump stocks, 8 AR-10s, one Ruger bolt-action rifle, and one 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. He was prepared to be there a lot longer than he was, but instead, a simple little door alarm foiled his plans. When police searched Stephen's car, they found ammonium nitrate fertilizer and tannerite, both used to make improvised explosives. They also found 1,600 rounds of ammunition, it's unknown why he had the explosive ingredients and extra rounds in his car. It seemed as though he had some plans in the event he escaped from the casino after the shooting. When his computers were analyzed, they found searches for upcoming outdoor concerts and festivals. It's clear that he chose Las Vegas as his target because he started searching for information about buildings in the city. He specifically searched for the height of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Then he began to narrow it down more with searches about Las Vegas SWAT and specifically, do police use explosives? They also found hundreds of pictures of child pornography on his computer. Records revealed that Stephen had rented a condo overlooking the Life is Beautiful festival the week before the Harvest Festival, but he chose not to carry his attack out on that group. His houses and a storage facility were searched and they found more guns which were stored in gun safes. Otherwise, his homes didn't present anything out of the ordinary. Mary Lou returned to the U.S. where she was questioned. It was initially published that she was a likely accomplice, but she assured the police that she had no idea what Stephen was going to do. His family members said the same thing. They hadn't seen any signs that Stephen was upset or suicidal. As soon as the crowd had realized that someone was shooting, they ran in every direction. They didn't know where the shooter was, so they didn't know which way to go. There were 22,000 people in attendance, and it created a massive amount of chaos. People had to leave injured loved ones behind in order to escape the gunfire. Good Samaritans began loading people into their trucks and rushing them to the hospital. 58 people died that day, and 867 were injured. One woman died in 2019, and another died in 2020, both from complications from their injuries, bringing the total casualties to 60. Nobody will ever know why Stephen Paddock did what he did. He didn't leave a note. He didn't leave a manifesto. He didn't even hint to his friends or family. Whatever evil he was feeling, he kept it bottled up inside until he unleashed it on the world. People can make suggestions or offer opinions, but at the end of the day, he was just a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.